So here's what we're going to do. My intent for the presentation was to keep it at the level of intuition, uh, talk a little bit about the technical details. Uh, super happy for the data science genius out there to jump in or for you guys to jump in and augment what I'm talking about. So I also feel like I've got too much content, so I'm going to just talk for 45 minutes or so, and then we'll uh, we'll see where we go. All right. Yeah. Can you make that go away? All right. So uh, one thing I do at Synaptic is I do sales calls. I've been on a lot of those things, and there's always two questions that get asked. One is, how much will it cost? That always comes at the end, but actually, how much data do we need is one of the questions that everybody always asks. So Erskine, if you can go one more. You know, and those are important because you got to have money or resources of some kind to get started, but the data is always the thing that is, at least in my experience, the prime mover for success, right? It's the thing that can kill a project if you don't have enough of it, if you've got the wrong kind. So if you go one more slide, it is the case, there's, if there's one thing that's true in machine learning, it is that more data is better. So there's this great paper, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data, written a while ago. It's actually riffing on this older paper, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and the Natural Sciences, where uh, the author there was like, isn't it weird that F, F equals MA? We've got all these equations that sort of really kind of capture what's happening in the natural sciences. The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data paper essentially says, uh, data covers for a multitude of sense, right? So if you got a bunch of data, you don't have to be super smart, you don't have to be super clever, you can kind of throw whatever model you want to at it and things will actually work out pretty well. The thing that we're gonna talk about today, um, if you go to the next slide, is we're gonna think about low data cases. So just for today, I'm gonna to narrow the focus a little bit. So we're gonna talk about supervised learning uh, where you've got things and labels. So the things could be pictures, for example, and the labels could be, is there a koala in the picture or not? Super general, tremendous amount of machine learning that you do in industry is, is supervised. Uh, so we're going to think about classification problems where I'm going to give you an image and it could be uh, a number of things. So is it a koala or not? Is there a horse, a cat, or a dog? Yeah, come on in. Have a seat. Uh, yep. Is there a horse or a cat or a dog in it? Um, there are lots of other settings where, you know, is there a tumor or not in, in the image? So we're going to think about supervised learning with classifiers. We're also going to focus mostly on neural networks and mostly on machine vision, just because I got to narrow the focus a little bit to come up with examples. The one thing I wanted to say, if you're not a neural network expert, is I just want to talk a little bit about what they're doing. It'll take me one minute and we'll just need that background when we're moving forward is that in a neural network, you can just think of it as stages of processing. So a thing a thing goes in on one side, um, it goes through steps of processing. On the output side, the network is gonna say yes or no. It's gonna say, here's one of a thousand things that might be in the image and I'll, I'll tell you which one it is. But importantly, the processing or the stages of processing go from raw pixel data to you can think about it as other representations of the data that find other kinds of features. So for example, if I'm trying to find out if there's a koala in the image so that I can tell people, hey, go look, there's a koala, we mean a koala that's out of its cage at the zoo, you might find uh, features that correspond to eyes and nose and ears. A little bit later though, the features get to be bigger and more aggregated and closer to the kind of thing that you're trying to decide about at the end. So ah, like there's the head or the body of a koala. But then eventually you sort of push it out to this last stage where you've got very high level features. And then based on those things, you have a simple little network that says, just given those features, can I make the appropriate decision as to what's in the data? So just want that groundwork because we'll, we'll sort of get to that in a second. Okay, so next slide. Sometimes you just don't have much data. Uh, you know, um, you go to a client and they say, we're a startup, for example. So we're gathering data about customer interactions. We just don't have that many customers. We're not able to predict churn yet, that kind of thing. Maybe it's a physical process. So you're flying drones around, you're having them look at pipelines, you're looking for faults. There just aren't that many faults. So sometimes it really is the case that you just don't have much data. You can't really easily go get more. And so we have to think about what to do in that circumstance. Sometimes, though, you've got lots of data, but not much of it is labeled. So, for example, maybe you've got lots of x-ray images, but you got to pay an expensive physician or somebody like that to label them as to whether there are, uh, you know, whether there's lung cancer or it's just hard. There's a physical process. I gather some genomics data, but I got to run a test on it and it's hard to do. So we're going to think about these two cases, not much data, 
you got a lot of data, but you just don't have much of it labeled. And we'll separate those two cases out and think about what to do in both of them. So one more slide or advance once. So here's the things we're going to try and talk about. We'll see how much of this we get through. In the you just don't have much data case, we'll talk about transfer learning, which you should sort of, this is kind of the default way of attacking problems these days, especially in machine vision. We'll talk about finding data or creating data. There's a little bit of subtlety or art that's involved in doing that kind of thing. Few shot learning is um, sort of an overloaded term, but it means like you really don't have much data. I've got sort of, you know, three examples of the things I'm trying to learn about, and that's all I can get. What can I do? Turns out there's a lot of algorithmic cleverness there. And then in the cases where you've got lots of things but a few labels, you can be smart about how you choose like the next things to label. Like I don't want to bug that human expert too much, so I can be smart about asking them what I want to have. Or I can take advantage of all those unlabeled things out there to make things work better. So we'll try and get through all those things. So we'll talk about transfer learning to start with. So let's think about le like learning to drive a car. Um, before you did driver's ed, whatever the version is that you guys do out here in Portland. Um, I had three daughters that I, I, I worked with in, in Maryland, took them through the driving process. What did you know, like before you took a lesson, what did you know that was super helpful when you sat down to learn to drive a car? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, on the right, break on the left. Yeah, so you knew that, right? Because you'd like been in cars and you'd seen people driving, right? What else? Steering wheel, right? That's right. You've seen that kind of thing. You also knew a lot about, like, like you've seen stop signs and stop lights, and you kind of knew what the behavior was that was going on there. But what did you learn during the driving lessons, right? So you get a little bit of instruction, and, and really what you're doing is you're kind of fine tuning that knowledge, right? So I know a bunch of stuff, but then I got to kind of put it all together and use that to solve a particular problem. Think about, though, for those of you who didn't learn on a stick, right? You learn to drive an automatic transmission. You had a tremendous amount of knowledge, right? So it wasn't like you sort of, you went, okay, I can handle these two things. There's this new thing over here and I gotta learn some stuff. Like, how do I manage that, right? But you have all this knowledge here from driving a manual transmission that you leveraged when you came over here. You didn't go, oh, new task. I'm gonna sort of blow up my brain and start completely from scratch over here, right? So you did transfer learning. And so transfer learning is essentially that, right? So. In machine learning, um, and we're going to talk about this picture here just very briefly, um, there, are, uh, there are methods in transfer learning where you say, here's a neural network. And so remember, I said, we're going to think about neural networks. And I talked about how they have layers of processing, right? So when you train a neural network from scratch, each of these layers have weights or parameters or real numbers that you have to try and set those so that it is accurate for the classification tasks that you are trying to solve, right? And you use training data to do that. So in this case, the, you can think about this part of the network as finding those features. So remember I said before, it might learn to identify eyes and ears and noses and then heads and bodies and then things that look like koalas, right? And then down here at the very end, you're saying, okay, given those things that I can find in the image, can I classify that as a koala or not? All right. So when you do transfer learning, you take a network that has been pre-trained on a similar task. So where do you get that? Right. There are a tremendous number of online model zoos, like most of the deep learning packages have them built in. And um, you can also train one from scratch on data that's sort of plentiful or close to yours. So a very, very common thing, and I've seen an example of this in a minute, is that there are lots of networks out there that are trained up on the ImageNet database, which is a big collection of naturally occurring images that has a thousand different categories in it. So the task is, is there a stingray or a manta ray or a motorcycle or a cow or a horse or any of these sort of thousand things? So what that network learns to do is to solve a thousand way classification problem but to do that, it has to learn a whole lot about what things look like in the physical world, right? So it sort of knows a bunch, sort of like what you were learning when you were, like when you started learning to drive, you knew a lot. You didn't really know how to kind of put all that knowledge together to drive, but you figured that out with experience. Okay, so transfer learning says, I don't want to train network from scratch because doing that requires a lot of data. So I'm going to find one that is pre-trained on a similar task. All right, so the next slide. Then what you do 
is instead of blowing up your entire brain, you just blow up this part of your brain, right? So you go, hey, I've got this network that knows a lot about what stuff looks like in the physical world. I don't really know how to put those pieces together. So what I will do is I'm going to reconstruct this little bit down here at the end that takes those features and then makes a classification decision. So in this case, instead of solving a thousand way problem, we've got, for example, three classes that can come out. So we freeze the network, sort of all of this part, and say, whatever features you used to look for in the physical world, find those features. And we're hoping that they're going to be useful for that downstream task. Um, and so we need to train up our new classifier, right? So uh, if your features were good for driving a manual transmission, they should be good for driving a stick. But then you got to learn how to sort of look at things slightly differently. All right, so next. Then we train that new classifier, right? So interestingly, lots of trainable, param trainable parameters all through here. These were trained up on a very large data set through that pre-training process. We're only going to fine tune this piece over here. So we need less data to do that. And we're hoping that the features from the old problem are going to help us on the new problem. So that's step three. And then finally, you unfreeze the last bit of the features, right? So we've used these old features for solving the problem. We've trained a new classifier. And then what we do is we say, all right, we're gonna let these features here at the very end adapt themselves. So it uh, turns out that when you do deep learning, the features that are kind of close to the input, especially in visual domains, look a lot like edges, textures. And then as they get further down, <coughs> excuse me, they start kind of fine tuning themselves for the particular domain. So if I'm trying to do koala versus not koala, I'm going to get very koala like features out here, right? But if now I want to do cat versus dog, then I need to fine tune these things so that I can build cat and dog features out of those things. All right. And then the last step, I think. Oh, okay. So that's it. So here's a very simple experiment I ran <clears throat> just to show you what the difference is. So on the horizontal axis, we have the number of instances going from 100 to 1,000 in increments of 100. The task was to use this data set called CIFAR10, which is these little 32 by 32 pixel images of cats and dogs and horses and um, airplanes and a few other things. <clears throat> so it's a binary classification task, which means, and they were balanced. So if you do random guessing, you get 50% accuracy. And I had this VGG16 network, which was the one that we saw in the previous slides. One was with no pre-training. So I just took this raw network. It knew nothing about the world. And I trained it up on this task. And you can see that at 100 instances of the cat dog, it's doing slightly better than random guessing. And it sort of slowly climbs. And at 1,000 instances, it's getting about 75% accuracy on testing, right? And this is you know, lots of iterations, held out test data, averaging, right? So the results are pretty solid. However, if I use the VGZ16 network that was pre-trained from ImageNet, right, which I just grabbed online, then at 100 instances, it's already up in the sort of low 70s in accuracy. At 200 instances, it's about 80. And at asymptotes, slightly higher than 80, right? So just using this pre-trained network, allows you to very quickly get accuracy that was what you were getting out here at the end, basically, if you didn't do pre-training, all right? Okay, so transfer learning pros and cons works really, really well. Uh, much less expensive than training a model from scratch, right? If you train a model and you have done no pre, if you've just randomly initialized, lots of data, lots of iterations through the data to try and get it to maximize accuracy, and there are a ton of freely available pre-trained networks that are out there. Cons are, you know, the pre-training task and the final task have to be similar. So if I tried pre-training, for example, on X-ray images, and I tried to use that to classify cats and dogs, probably wouldn't work as well. And sometimes, you know, it's hard to get an initial network for unusual tasks. So if your data set's an oddball when they're not naturally occurring, that can be hard. Okay. So... Next topic then, and again, we're thinking small data sets. So the first example was, don't have much data. What I need to do is to try and leverage another data set to build a network that's like in kind of a good space that I can start fine tuning. 
This one, we're not going to do that. We're going to try and actually find more data or build data. So if you go to the next slide, um, there's Google has a data set search uh, option that's great. So when I teach machine learning classes and students are looking for projects, I say go to the data set search and type in some keywords to find something that you might uh, think might be interesting. You can use data sets that you find out there for free training, right? So if I could find something that's kind of close to what I want to do, right? I could pre-train a network on that. I could find a data set that's exactly what I'm looking for and, pre and train from scratch, or I could add it to my data. There's also Kaggle, which has a tremendous number of data sets, many of which are very sort of real world business applications. So finding data, good way to get started. Next slide. The other thing that you can do is data augmentation, which, as it says up there, should be standard operating procedure. The idea is that if I have a one image, I can use that to create lots of other examples of the thing. So I don't know, like, what is that? This, what is that? I don't know what it is. Like a hedgehog or something? What is that? OK, I don't know. So we've got some animal here, which apparently is rare. It's hard to find pictures of them, right? And what I'd like to do is to just construct more. So I will just apply transformations to that one image. I can rotate it. I can flip it. I can randomly crop it. I can change the contrast. I can add weird backgrounds to it. And what that will do for me is allow me to just generate transformations of the image, hopefully that look like ones that might naturally occur in, in processes in the real world, um, and turn that one image into potentially hundreds of other images. If it's non-image data, you can do things like adding noise to it. You can actually do that with image data. But if I just have sort of standard vector valued features, I can add noise to them. I can also interpolate between instances. So I can take two instances and compute the average of them. And there's a new instance. And we'll actually, we'll see another version of that later. So data augmentation is a way of taking um, the data that you've got and making it go further. Uh, and again, that's just standard process. Everyone does data augmentation these days. All right, so next. And then the last one is synthetic data, which is really sort of interesting because um, there's a lot of subtlety that goes on here. So in this case, for example, I'm looking for cracks in pipelines. There's not a crack. So I actually went in and just sort of drew in a crack, right? But like, I don't know, that doesn't look really good. That can't work, right? And, and, and so you know, like, why won't it work? It won't work because it doesn't look like a real crack in a pipeline but we can actually make this work better. So go one more slide. So there are a lot of use cases. Um, like you're looking for guns in public places or faults in infrastructure or tanks and aerial images, right? So we can find lots of examples of the target object and the target background. So uh, just go ahead and one maybe. Yeah, so public place and a gun, right? Easy to find these. Easy to find images of these online. Harder to find both together in any sort of natural setting. So if you go one more further, so you go, all right, let me do something like this, right? There's a gun in a, um, in a natural setting. But the problem is that the, the network will learn, oh, when I see this sort of white box sitting there, that's a gun. And it doesn't matter whether there's a gun or a cat or a person in a white box, it'll go like, okay. So um, there, right. So there is this idea that you can create synthetic data, right? So if I'm looking for guns in public places, for example, I can do this pasting that goes on. Turns out that there are a lot of considerations, like what am I going to paste? Where am I going to paste it? And then how am I going to paste it? So again, if you do this sort of ham-fisted, just like here's a gun on a white background and I start slapping it all over images, the network goes white background, that means it's a gun. Now, um, many people will sort of go down the rabbit hole of trying to make this thing look perfectly natural. And so if you're a machine learning person, a lot I've heard many conversations with machine learning people who say, we tried to use a GAN, right? A GAN is a method for synthesizing data in ways that's supposed to look very realistic. And I've never heard one of them say, and it worked really well. Right, so they're like, ah, like it kind of got there. So the point is that there is a sort of like level of diminishing returns as you try and make it look more and more realistic. You spend more and more time on it, and it just doesn't quite get you there. So, turns out that there are a few strategies you can do. So, one is you can try different blending strategies, right? So I can paste that thing in there, and I can try and 
smooth out the noise. I can blend it into the background in a lot of different ways. And by using different blending methods, the network starts not paying attention to the way it's embedded in the image. Adding noise to it is another one of those options and then adding distractor objects. So if I add guns that I've blended in, I add people that I've blended in, it can't go, oh, there's that weird blending artifact and that's a gun, right? It has to start paying attention to the contents of the thing that you blended in. So this notion of copy pasting, and in this case, we're like got giraffes and, is that a flamingo? I'm sorry, the image is so, that's a flamingo, right? It might be an emu. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think it's an emu, right? Good call. All right. And soccer players, right? So now, I don't know, let me create images where I've got people playing soccer near giraffes and their emus and other places, right? It turns out that this cut and paste baseline, if you do it really, really well, is hard to beat. But you have to try these strategies of using different blending methods and sort of adding distractors and things like that. Okay. All right. So the pros and cons of just trying to generate more data from scratch, right? So, or, or to find it. It really is the case that we're living in a golden age of data. There's a tremendous amount of data. You can find data on just about anything out there. So, lots of resources available. Data augmentation, everybody does it, significantly improves accuracy almost all the time. And it can be super effective and simple for building out these machine vision data sets. Can be finicky, right? So especially the cut and paste thing, though you can make it work well, it can be hard to make it work in practice. Um, and it's also sometimes hard to know which of the methods are gonna work well for your particular task. It's a lot of it's trial and error and just trying to figure out what works. So then few shot learning, let's talk about that. So this is the last one where we're going to think about having just a small data set that we can't really expand. A um, couple of use cases that I'm, I want to think about or say signature verification. Uh, you sign a card, you go to the bank, you open an account, you sign a card, maybe you've got one example, maybe a couple of examples, and you want to be able to detect forgery, right? So is this your signature or not? Face recognition, I got a couple of, take a couple of pictures of you when you enroll the health club. And I just want the door to open if you're a member or not open if you're not a member, right? So there's that caveat up there that's kind of hard to see. What I will say is that there are, um, like a lot of what we're talking today, talking about today could be sort of few shot or low shot learning. There's even one shot learning, there's zero shot learning, right? But what I want to talk about in the next couple of slides is just a very, very clever way of dealing with this problem that has shown a tremendous amount of promise and is very widely used. So I do need to give you just like a little bit of background um, and this notion of encoding. So one thing that you can do with a machine learning model is you can take an input. And in this case, uh, this is probably, we're thinking about this being from the MNIST data set, which is like 28 by 28 pixel hand-drawn digits, it's like zero through 10, right? What you can do is you can train up a thing called an encoder that takes that 28 by 28 array of integers and turns it into a much smaller array of integers, in this case, like 10, right? So what I will learn to do is I'll learn to take an input and squeeze it down into a much smaller thing, and we're going to call that an encoding or an embedding, right? Now, we do this all the time. Go one more, advance once, right? And so... Like, how do I know that like, you know, so I could map all the digits down to exactly that thing. That's not super useful because it's not discriminating. So one way to think about what a useful encoding is, is can I use that encoder to then recover the original, that encoding to recover the original image, right? So if it has enough information in it to mostly reconstruct that that was a two, and then if I take a zero and turn it into 10 numbers and it can reconstruct that zero, then that seems useful. All right, so very common operation to take an input thing, compress it down into a much smaller thing, and then do stuff with that downstream. Okay, so one more. Right, so uh, here's a configuration that's used very commonly in these sort of uh, face recognition, signature recognition kinds of domains. And we'll talk about Siamese networks and triplet law. So what have we got going on here? So obviously this example is old. Uh, Obama was president. Who is that? Is that Macron? Is that him? Okay. 
I think is another world leader, right? Okay. So in this case, uh, Barack Obama got enrolled in the health club, right? So he gave a picture. Now we've got another picture of him and then this other guy hanging around who also enrolled at the health club, right? So what we want to do is we want to train a system just based on these few examples that can say, hey, uh, if I get a new image in, is it Obama or I'm going to call him a Chrome? All right. So how do we do that? So we're going to use a Siamese network. What's, what's the Siamese network? Can I walk over here? So uh, it is a network. In this case, it's a convolutional neural network that knows how to take an image and turn it into one of these embedding things, right? So it's just going to say, here's an image. I'm going to turn it into a vector or a list of numbers. Now, the reason it's a Siamese network is because these are all doing exactly the same operation. So here, the, the weights here, the weights here, the weights here are all shared. They're exactly the same thing. So if I take this image and hand it here, I get this embedding. If I take that image, I get that embedding, and it's doing the same computation. All right, now, what is a triplet loss doing? The triplet loss says, hey, when you're training this thing up, what I would like you to do is for these two images that are of the same person, I want you to give me very similar embeddings for that thing, right? Like, it doesn't matter if it's this Obama or that Obama or a completely different picture of Obama. I would like them all to sort of wind up looking very similar when I convert them into that vector of numbers. However, that's not Obama. So I would like that to look very different from these two, right? So I'm training this thing up to go, if it's the same, if it's the anchor and a positive example of it, they should be very similar. And the anchor and the negative should be very different from one another, right? So now notice it's not really a classification task at this point. It's just saying, I want the same thing to look similar here and the different things to look different. All right, so if we go one more. So the learning problem is, again, if you think about, I've got, there's Obama, there's Obama, there's Macron. They're been projected into this low dimensional space. The learning process says, ah, well, I'd like the sort of anchor and the positive examples to move closer to one another and the anchor and the negative examples to move further apart, right? So. I will take embed the anchor and the positive so that they move close together and the anchor and the negatives to move further apart. Okay, so one more. All right, so why does it work? There are lots of ways of thinking about it. One is, you know, if I've got three examples of 100 people, I could treat that as a, you know, 100 class classification problem and I've got 300 examples, right? On the other hand, if I start using the triplet loss, you can just do a tiny little bit of math and see, well, I can actually have about 1,800 unique combinations of these things to train up my embedding. So the fact that I'm learning these embeddings means that I'm just learning to make things that are, that are the same thing on the input look very similar on the output, and it just generalizes extremely well. OK? All right. So why does it work? It, it actually works really well when you've got just a few examples of each class. And again, it's this notion of, I'm just trying to learn to kind of push the same thing into the same part of the space and different things into different parts of the space. They can handle a very large number of classes. So lots of faces that are enrolling at the health club or lots of different signatures. Uh, depending on how you solve the classification task, it can be expensive and you might need to sort of iterate over. Here's a guy that just, or a girl that just showed up at the health club. Let me go through and embed them and then compare them to all the embeddings of the people that I know about and see if I can find one that's close to it. And the output then is just the similarity. It's not a probability. And so you typically need some logic, right? Like, okay, like th this embedding is it's like close to Obama, right? But is it close enough, right? Is it really Obama or is it just somebody that kind of looks like him but hasn't paid the health membership dues, right? So you, you have to sort of have some additional stuff going on to make that decision. So now we're going to switch gears, right? So that those methods were all, here's the data I've got. Thank you very much. That's all I can get you right? This is, I've got a bunch of data. So um, I got a bunch of customer data. Uh, but I have to get a human to come in and do some labeling on it. And I just, I can't pull people away to do that. And actually, we've dealt with that many times where people say, got a bunch of data, and we're just kind of hanging out waiting on them to label it, right? So this case, tons of things, few labels. All right. So here's an example. And we're going to think about active learning in this case, right? And active learning is I'm going to ask the teacher for help. So here's a bunch of math problems, right? 
we got these subtraction problems. Notice we know the answers to these guys. We don't know the answers to these. And notice this guy hanging out down here. All right. So go ahead one more. So you can think about this as here's a bunch of labeled data, right? Here's, here's the input. Here's the desired output. We have a bunch of unlabeled data. Here's the input. Don't know what the desired output is. All right. You can ask the teacher for more labels. What's your strategy going to be? Like, like, what are you going to do in this case? Bring an apple. What? Bring an apple. Bring an apple. Well, I would say, okay, like, I think I can handle that. I don't know. Maybe I should ask the teacher about that one, right? I don't know what's going on down there. So let me think about asking the teacher that. So in active learning, what you do is you think about, I'm going to look at all of these guys down here. Maybe I'm thinking, like, I'm, I can nail that one. I know that. I can probably get the answer to that. A little less certain about what's going on here. So let me be smart and ask the teacher about that one because I have access, sort of limited access to the teacher. I will have to say that I did. The answers to this were not provided when I stole this image from the internet. So I had to solve this myself. Yeah. Yeah, that was not long, but I did look at the answers very carefully because I thought I'll look real dumb if I mess up one of those. <laughs> so, all right. Ah, that's true, actually. Yeah. Okay. So let's go one more. Okay, so here's the situation, right? So you got lots of things. I've got long x-rays, I've got support tickets, I've got images of products rolling off a production line, but I don't have the labels, right? So is it cancer or not? What support queue should that support ticket go to? Is there a defect in the product or not? So here's the kind of situation. If you think about my, my things are embedded in a two-dimensional space, I just have a big, a big mass of them, right? And I'm going to tell you that underneath this, there's a two-class classification problem. So if you go one more step, one thing you could do is you could say, hey, teacher, um, I'm just going to choose a random sample of these things and say label those, right? So, you know, I've got, I don't know, I can, I can sort of make my employees spend eight hours on it and they can label 100 of these in eight hours. Let me just choose randomly. Now, it's probably hard to see, but we've got some red points and some like purple points out there, purple or blue, purple, purple, right, okay. Um, now, this shows what happens if I, in one case, if I just say, hey, I'm gonna choose a random sample of these things and I'm gonna learn. And what this line does is it is the system's best guess as to what separates the reds from the blues, right? Now, if you look underneath this, obviously what's going on is like this big mass of things is red, this big mass of things is purple. Sorry, I keep changing the color on this side. But you can see that just by the way you did the random sampling, you've got this line, which is probably not optimal, right? Now, go one more, I can't remember. Okay, so, all right. So, so now suppose you've seen that data, right? So you got some reds here, there's like a couple of reds here, there's purples, there's purples. If you were going to go to the teacher, does anybody have any ideas on like where in that space you might say, hey, like show me some more examples? Where? Yeah. Why in the middle? Because that's where they're overlapping. You're not sure how to say. You're not sure what's going on, right? So, like, for example, you're not going to ask you about that, right? You're pretty sure that's red. Like, you're pretty sure that's purple, but I, like, I don't know. There's like some confusion going on in it here. So, active learning is about trying to use the thing that you're learning to guide the selection of the next examples to be labeled. All right, so if you go one more. So here's one where actually we did a lack of learning and we sort of got more resolution in this space and we did better. So go one more slide. So here's how active learning works this is one instantiation of it. All these methods are lots and lots of different ways of doing them. Um, we'll take a small random sample of the data. We'll get somebody to label it and we're gonna learn a model, right? Which is we'll sort of, get some labels, we'll do that line right there. And then we're gonna use this thing that we learned to label all the other data points, right? So we've got a thing that can take in an instance and give me a label. We'll say, hey, let's go make predictions about those things. And we're gonna use them all to score the data points. We'll talk about how to do that in just a second. And we'll get the labels for the highest scoring point or the lowest scoring, right? But in essence, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the model to attach a number. And then we'll say, we'll use those numbers to say, hey, let's go back to, sorry, we'll get the labels for those guys and go back to step three, right? So what we're doing is in essence, we're 
random sample, learn the model, use that model to figure out what points we want to classify, or, or sorry, to label next, and then start building our data set out like that. All right, so one more. Lots of things you can do. So, you know, how do you score them? You might say, hey, model, if, if I output probabilities, for example, I could say, look at all the points that are unlabeled. Tell me which ones you're least certain about, right? So it's exactly what Stephen was saying. Don't really know what's going on out there. Maybe you should, you know, choose some points that are, you know, I'm uncertain about. The other way to think about it is like how close you are to that boundary, right? Because the boundary is the dividing line and it might be, and these are often very interrelated, uncertainty and proximity to the boundary is that, you know, I, you know, I don't know, like whatever's going on in here seems like it's super important. So let me start asking where you are relative to the boundary. Those are called margin-based methods. Okay. So the interesting thing about active learning is you can intelligently manage the limited resources, right? So I can get a week's worth of work out of my people to do labeling. Let me build this model to start with. I'll use it to start choosing the ones that I want my people to label. So build a model, say, here's the first batch you're gonna label, build another model, repeat that process. It works with virtually every machine learning model, um, super easy to do, simple to implement. Um, you know, cons, it requires iterated model training, right? So like I've got to build a model, ask for more labels, build a model. That's typically not that much of a problem these days. Sometimes it's harder to know when to stop asking for more labels. Um, another thing that's a little bit more problematic is sometimes those scores, like the uncertainties can be just real close to one another, right? So, you know, a difference of 0 0.0001 and it's kind of hard. How do you adjudicate that? So, um, you know, that's sort of, there's no sort of easy way to sort them and go, ah, that's the cutoff, right? Because they tend to be very close. But again, you know, you could say, well, I'll pick the next hundred, I'll label those and kind of go from there. Semi-supervised, okay. So again, the idea here is um, lots of things, just a few labels. All right, so if we go forward, yeah. So same setup as active learning, lots of things not, just a few labels, but in this case, there's no Oracle, right? There's no human. You're not actually going to be able to go to a person and say, hey, like, what is this thing? Is there lung cancer here or not? So we're going to use algorithms instead. Um, typically, these semi-supervised methods that are not required, that are not having an Oracle who will give you the correct answer, make some assumptions. And these are actually sort of like very reasonable assumptions. Smoothness just means um, essentially you know, if I just move, like that guy's labeled red, if I just move a little bit, the next thing should be labeled red, right? So if I'm stringing in that local neighborhood, my class label is not going to change very much. The clustering assumption and the low density separation are basically the same thing, which means there tend to be these sort of clumps of points that are the same label. There are dense regions that have a label. There are dense regions that have a label. And then these sort of other regions where they're not very dense, that tends to be the separating line between the instances. All right. So if you go one more slide, so self-training, the really oldie but goodie, um, can work well. You typically need to be a little bit more subtle than this. Uh, and the way self-training works is you just label a sample of instances, right? So again, I'm just going to pick a set of instances at random, pretty much. I'm going to learn a classifier. I'm going to call that the teacher, and that's going to be like a little small model, right? So it's not going to be a giant neural network. It'll be a small one because I'm only going to give a few instances, and I want it to be able to generalize as well. So then. I'll take the teacher to label all the other instances, because remember, I've got this big set of other instances out there that are unlabeled, and I will keep the labels that are most confident, right? So I've learned on a little bit of data, and then I'm going to go, and I'm like, I'm like really confident that's cancer, and I'm really confident that's not cancer. I will then add those labels to the instances. Um, sorry, keep those labels that are most confident. Um, typically add a little bit of noise because it helps smooth the decision boundary. Um, and then learn a classifier and the expanded data set that we're going to call the student that's a larger model because it has access to more data, right? So all I've done is I've said, hey, like, learn on this. Tell me what you think about everything else in the data set, right? Label these guys. And then if you seem pretty confident, I'm going to learn a model based on that, right? So now I've, I've taken my unlabeled data I've used a model to label it, and I'm training a new model to kind of capture that. Now, lots of problems, lots of potential problems. So for example, there's a thing called confirmation bias, which is like this simple model goes, 
that's a positive instance. And then the teacher goes, yeah, that's a positive instance, right? When it learns, but the, the teacher was just wrong, about it, right? So there's a little bit of subtlety in making sure that you take care of that. All right, so two more methods. And then I think I'm done with the technical stuff. There's, there's this other sort of very interesting idea, which is very, very common in semi-supervised learning, which is this big, massive, unlabeled instances, which is basically you just want the classifier to be consistent. So here's here's the idea. Like you, you can stare at this picture if you want to, but um, I, like it looks complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. So, so for the ones where you've got labels, you just do standard training, right? It's like, okay, here's an instance. Somebody told me what the correct answer is for that thing. I would like you to produce that answer, and I'm going to penalize the model and force it to start giving me the correct answer. For unlabeled instances, what I'll do essentially is I'll take an instance and I'll kind of pass it through the network and I'll say, hey, what do you think this is, right? And it'll go, ah, 70% cat, 30% dog, for example, right? Then I'm gonna take that instance and I'm gonna add noise to it in some way, right? I'll use one of my augmentation methods. Maybe I'll sort of mess with the network a little bit, but I'm just gonna noise it up and then hand it through the network again. If the network then goes, ah, I can't remember what numbers I used before. 70%, 30%. what? Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're paying more attention to me than I am, right? Um, now, if it goes 70% cat, 30% dog, you're like, come on, right? That's not right. Because I just like, I changed it a little bit. So in some sense, it's violating that smoothness constraint, right? Like if I just noise the instance up, you shouldn't just completely change your mind about it. So what we do is we say, all right, network, you don't know what the true label is, but don't be changing your mind like that, right? So you also penalize the network for changing its mind when it's an instance that's been had, had noise added to it. It turns out that there's a tremendous amount of work on essentially using this thing called a consistency loss, which is just saying, if I give you a slightly different version of it, you shouldn't change your mind a whole lot. And forcing the network to be consistent about the labels that it's applying to things where it hasn't seen the label just makes it learn a lot better. And the nice thing is, if I got a label, I use that in the standard way. If I don't have a label, I just do this little process and we're good to go. All right, one more slide with one more method and then we're done. The, uh, and again, this looks super complicated, but it's not. This path is just, hey, this is a two and I know it's a two. I wanna train you to tell me that it's a two. This path goes, all right, let's pick a random instance two random instances actually. So I picked a, a digit five and a digit one. What I'm gonna do is blend those two things together, right? I'm literally gonna just do this sort of weighted combination of them. It's like I'm interpolating between averaging the two. And I'm gonna pass that instance through the network. And it, what we're gonna do again is have this consistency thing which says, hey, you thought that was, I don't know, like 10% five and 90% six or whatever, right? So there's some distribution over what digit you think it is. There's some distribution over what you think this digit is. Should be the case that if I average those two things together, I can average what you thought the two pieces were and come up with this sort of average prediction. It's another example of trying to say, you gotta be consistent. If I see a thing and another thing and I blend them, then the, the thing you produce as output should be a blend of the two things that you thought for the individual instances. <laughs> ah, good, right. So the, the nice thing about this is that like, if the number of classes is large and I just pick two random instances, they're probably different classes, right? So the blend of those two things is gonna be sitting somewhere in between the mass, right? It's gonna be in that sort of low density region that we assume exists in between the two classes. And so we're forcing the network to spend more time thinking about where the boundary should be between those two. Okay. So again, two low data cases. You just don't have much data. You get a bunch of data, but you don't, just, just don't have many labels, right? So we talked about transfer learning, finding or making new, new data, this sort of one-shot learning. If you just like really, really don't have much data. And then active learning, the idea being, if I've got limited resources, I can be smart about how I use those things for labeling and then semi-supervised where I'm just gonna be clever about algorithms to leverage that data that's not been labeled. All right, so again, the two questions that we had to getting started and, and kind of finishing with success is 
re remember that paper that I pointed to said about the unreasonable effectiveness of data said, I don't know if you get a bunch of data, just like you don't have to be too smart, right? Just throw it all at a model, build it, things will actually work out pretty well. If you don't, then you got to be a little bit more clever, right? You kind of need to know more about what you're doing. The good news is that there's an enormous number of methods out there that you can uh, that you can take advantage of.